So let me just briefly introduce Ed and Rosa. I'll, I'll begin with Rosa to my immediate right. Rosa O'Bannon is a graduate of UCLA where she and Ed met. And Rosa is not a sports fan. I want to begin no. with that, right? <laughs> no. At all, right? No. At all? Not, when I, not before I met him. Not before you met him. <laughs> uh, while in college, Rosa owned a business and, and worked. Well, I mean, this is just someone, yeah, I was just trying to get through college, right? Just going out on Saturday night and, and Thursday night. Uh, Rosa was... Oh, I went out well, too. Well, you went out too, but I, wasn't, <laughs> I didn't have to get up to go to work or anything. I was just there. Um, Rosa worked at a business, a retail business, at age 13. And through that opportunity, eventually uh, was able to purchase part of the store. And what is the store that it would be most similar to today, the chain? Forever 21. Forever 21. This was Forever 21 <laughs> before it was forever. It was just, <laughs> it was a, it was a st similar store. And I, I think that's part of the story, right? That you became very knowledgeable about business from a personal standpoint. You weren't, you know, some people study business. You were actually doing business. You were running a store while in college. And I would have to imagine that gave you a perspective that uh, is certainly relevant to Ed's case against the NCAA and issues of who owns what fundamentally, right? Do we own our identity? Do we own our image? Do we own our likeness? Do we own our names? And if we don't, why don't we? What is the law that leads us to a direction where a company can make a video game with us in it and we have no say over being in the game or get nothing from that game? Uh, and Rosa now works in education and she is intricately involved with counseling of students. And we'll talk about that as the night goes on. Uh, Ed O'Bannon is Rose's husband, and, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, first, and foremost. Ed, Ed, first and foremost. Ed, Ed's bio, I think you all know, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Ed was college basketball player of the year in 1995 at UCLA. He was the number one college basketball player in the country. He was also the number one high school recruit before he went to UCLA. And as we talk about in court justice, Ed wanted to go to UNLV initially. And UNLV was led by Jerry Tarkanian. Some of you may remember Jerry Tarkanian, just the most prominent college basketball coach in the 1980s, I think that's fair to say. He had the running Rebels, Anderson Hunt, Larry Johnson, a number of other players. And Ed was going to go there until the NCAA came in and sanctioned UNLV for recruiting violations. And that really changed your, your life course, because then you decided to go to UCLA, uh, which was not the school you initially wanted to go to. And it was great for UCLA, right? Because they were able to get the number one recruit in the country. And Ed also overcame a very serious knee injury uh, that, we, that we talk about in the book, a knee injury that uh, occurred during a, a scrimmage, yeah. right? You went up for a dunk and, and, and landed in an awkward way. All it takes is just you know, your balance on your leg being a little bit off, and that can change everything. Mm -hmm. And you overcame that injury and led the UCLA Bruins to the title. And you went on to play in the NBA. You were a lottery pick. I remember watching, I remember watching the NBA draft live that year uh, and then watching it again for the book. And it's a special moment. <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk about with your family and being a lottery pick and going on playing in the NBA. And then you went on to play in Europe for a number of years. Yeah. And then of course, Ed retired. And he and Rosa are living in Henderson, Nevada. Life is good, and then you hear about a video game. And why don't we just begin with that? The, you know, you're retired, you've had this great career, and then a friend of yours tells you, hey, Ed. My kid was playing a video game last night. You want to check it out? That was, that was how, he, uh, that's how he started it. Uh, he and I, we were just out throwing the, throwing the football, men and the kid, Spencer, that's his name. Uh, and we were just out throwing the football in the front, on the front yard. Uh, and then Michael uh, Curtis is his name. He played UN at UNLV um, back in the day. <laughs> he always says, you know, just a real quick, he always says, uh, yeah, Ed and I, we played against each other, and there were 
33, you know, combined points between us. He says, Ed had 31 and I had two. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's all. That's, if you know Mike Curtis, that's what he always says. But anyway, so uh, he and I, uh, we were, you know, uh, just hanging out or whatever. So we go in uh, to watch the, the game. Uh, and his son was playing it, and everything was great. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was on this video game, and I thought it was a, I thought it was the coolest thing, you know, to see. Or, I, you know, I grew up with Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man, and you know, uh, Pong or what is that? The yeah, Pong, Pong, yeah, all you know, <laughs> Astros, Atari, yeah. Asteroids, right. right? So to be on a video game was the ultimate, for at least for me. And and so, uh, but then we're sitting there, and he said, you know, he kind of tapped. He's like, hey man. I Pay sixty bucks for this, and you got nothing, you know. <laughs> uh, and I, I, you know, initially we laughed, um, but then thought about it, and I just, as a kid, as Spencer was, you know, he continued to play the video game, uh, but I just kind of sat on the side and really, you know, really almost kind of just zoned out, uh, and just was like, man, I can't believe this is actually still going on to this day. I'm in my mid thirties, and they're still making money you know, off of my face, off my likeness, whatever. But then that was it. Once I left this house, I left that memory in on the couch, you know, and I went on about my life. It wasn't, you know, ultimately it wasn't a big deal to me um, because it had happened before in, in various ways. Uh, and then um, Sandy Vaccaro called um, a few weeks later. And, and even before that, I had gotten home. Uh, she asked me how my day was and, we had went golfing that day, and I mean, it was a, actually a really good day. It was a beautiful day. Uh, and so I told her what my golfing day was like. And um, oh, and by the way, I saw my, my face on a video game. This is pretty cool, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then that was really kind of, that was really kind of it. And then a couple weeks later, Sonny Vaccaro calls uh, with, you know, an idea of, and I'm thinking about suing the NC2A. NC2A. In fact, that's what we're going to do. I've talked to a number of guys. No one seems to want to be the lead plaintiff. What do you think? Well, Mr. Vaccaro, actually, this is what I saw a couple of weeks ago. What do you think? Oh my God, this is, you'd be perfect. This, are you kidding me? This is, you know, you're the perfect plaintiff. Um, so if you can give me. Yeah, Rosa, what did you think about this? So Ed tells you he's in this video game. Did you think let's fight or did you think not a big deal. You know, I, I didn't think it was a big deal, like like it uh, said, um, because it, it happened before. Um, about three years prior, um, Coca-Cola was going to do, like, some kind of commercial. And they, um, they sent a contract. And I like to read. I like to know, yeah. again, what we're getting into. And there was some language within that contract that we were just not comfortable with. The compensation was $500, but it was more like, you know, the use of media and likeness and all this, the, all the rights that he was waiving. I'm like, for $500, I, I, I'm just not comfortable in what capacity they're going to be using your, your picture. Yeah. And so we said no. Um, so they had to, you know, make some changes. And But again, it was just, they could have, clearly, if they would have contacted the university, they could have gone ahead and and uh, done the, the uh, whatever advertising that we're going to do. So we were, we were familiar with that process in terms of how limited he was in, in, in voicing or saying no or that's not right. How about when he started talking about the case? Did you think this is too much? Because you know, that's a different level, right? That's, a, that's an investment of time, reputation, energy, all of that. I said to him, have uh, Mr. Vaccaro send the document so that I can yeah. read and learn more about just it. Just as an aside, Rosa negotiated the book contract, so Ed and I were just we were just letting her do all the negotiations. Do her things. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, and and so when 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 I came back and and talked to her about it, um, you know, we talked about look, our kids were coming up; they were in middle school. Um, a couple of them, you know, my youngest one plays baseball and he possibly, and basketball, so maybe he can earn a scholarship, uh, 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 an athletic scholarship. Our daughter is two years older than him. She's also in middle school at the time, 
or even going into high school. No, she's in middle school. She's in middle school as well. But, you know, and at the time she's, what, 6'2", 6'3". So she's got potential to get a, earn a basketball scholarship as well. So these are things that we're thinking about prior to, you know, actually becoming this, uh, you know, getting in this lawsuit. And, you know, what do we do? Do we, do we um, possibly jeopardize? Because if we get into this lawsuit, they're going to look at our kids like, you know, hey, maybe they don't, you know. I, you know, I don't know. Who, who knows? Who knows what they're thinking? Uh, as far as recruiting our kids, uh, what are the possible? Will will this will there be negative ramifications? You know, going forward with our kids, and and, and that sort of thing. Um, and there was just a number of different things that that we that we talked about, and then some of the the, the pros. Uh, we are shedding light on this subject. This is something that we don't like about college sports. Maybe we can shed light on it. Uh, this is an opportunity to do that. The, we've weighed pros and cons for a couple of days at least, uh, and then eventually decided to uh, to do it. But uh, those were, you know, among other things. Th those were some of the things that we talked about. And it's, it's, I think it's worth noting this was not a case where you would benefit directly financially. This was a case where a rule would be changed, where the relief would be injunctive relief where the court would say the NCAA has to stop doing something. And that's an important point because you're both at a point of your, your, your mid-30s, you got three kids, and you're remembered as this great college basketball player of the year. You have like a legacy. Mm -hmm. The easy thing would have been to not do the case. Right. right. The easy thing would have been to just say, well, you know, this, I don't benefit from this directly. Life goes on. Instead, you, you took the fight to the NCAA what what brought you to that? I mean, is that because that's you chose the path of a greater resistance, without any knowing you wouldn't get any money from it. Is that? I mean, that, that must mean you really believe firmly in what you were doing. Yeah, it 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 did, and it does. Um, you know, the amount of I, I if if I had a dollar for every person that came up and said you'll be rich from doing this. From suing it, we would actually be rich. You know? <laughs> uh, I mean, there is. I, I ran into I ran into a lot of people who assumed that we were that we were getting paid to do this. Um, that at the bare minimum we would, you know, get a million dollars for it. Well, that just seemed to be a round number that every you know people seemed to um, think that we were going to be getting. Um, but money was never really. A discussion. Um, I, I, I can remember talking to Mr. Vaccaro and Michael Hosfeld, uh, our lawyer. Uh, I can remember talking to him about, you know, I, I remember coming back in with him and saying, hey, look, you know, people are saying that I should be getting paid for this or, or once this is all said and done, we're going to be rich. What are they talking about? What, what, am, I, what am I missing here, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and his reply simply was, "This ain't about money. This is about this is about righting a wrong." Uh, and I'm like, "All right, cool. Let's you know, let's keep it going." I just at the time prior to that conversation, it was just like I kept. So I, I needed to I needed some I guess having that conversation with him, I needed some reinforcement from him, making sure that I'm I, that we're doing the right thing and that my mind is on. Uh, we're all on the same track here um, because I'm hearing from other people that aren't involved. Hey, you should be getting paid. Hey, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. Finally, it got to a point where it was like I had to pick up the phone and say, Michael, Mr. Vaccaro, well, you know, am I reading this wrong? You know, I thought this was about righting a wrong, but everybody seems to think that we should be getting paid. What am, what am I? That was, we had that conversation. So, uh, once we did, um, it was like, you know what, you know, we're not getting paid. So, you know, people relax. And this is like the the third year of the process. So it wasn't like towards mm -hmm. the end yeah. that, hey, by the way, you're, you know, there's, so we knew um, and we asked questions and they were very um, open with, okay, this is, this is what's changing and how 
you know, this is the angle that we that we will take to carry the, the, this lawsuit forward. So, uh, and we were very comfortable with that. We knew, um, and it seemed like, like Ed says, there were a lot of people making assumptions, um, but they were not educated on on what was going on. And I think, and people who didn't know the law, what the lawsuit was really about. I mean, right. That's, you know, the, the, and the lawsuit was about, really, there are two prongs of law. There was the right of publicity, that Ed and other college athletes have value in their name, image, and likeness, and that a commercial entity has to gain consent before they can use it. And then the other prong was antitrust law, which sounds complicated, but it really wasn't in this context. And antitrust law is an area of law that's about ensuring fair competition and ensuring that consumers are not mistreated by businesses that are conspiring in some way. But in this context, it's not the consumer that's hurt, it's the student athlete. And the competitors are universities. There are about 1,300 members of the NCAA. The argument is that they've joined hands to create rules that hurt the athletes. One of those rules is that athletes can't be paid in any way, shape, or form. Which on the surface, you may say, well, that's good, that's amateurism. But then think about it. Who are the amateurs in college sports? And who aren't? Who are? How about college coaches? Are they amateurs? Some of them make, what, $10 million a year. Uh, they're playing in professional stadiums. Their jerseys are being sold. They're beneficiaries of multi-billion dollar television contracts. It's almost as if everyone's an amateur except the student. Every, everyone is not a, an amateur except the student athlete. So the argument is that this is part of a conspiracy, not like conspiracy, you know, crazy ideas. It's just simply businesses that are competitors joining hands in ways that are more anti-competitive than pro-competitive. So that's really the case. And I imagine it, it traces back to being in college. Rosa, you probably saw how Ed, what he, all the money he was making for UCLA, but what what kind of treatment did he get? Not even not even equal to a to a regular student. One of the things that again, not knowing sports, that was interesting to me was the fact that he couldn't have a job. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't have a job? He says, I'm like, but I'm working. How come you can? He says, the NCAA won't, won't allow it. I'm like, but the, if you need the money and you need to go get a job, a part-time job at the student store somewhere where you're still on campus, in the cafeteria, anything that, and, and, and so those were the things that I, I didn't really understand the why. Like, who are they? Who's, your parents says that you can work. Why, who, who are the, these NCAA people? I um, so that was interesting to me. What happened? I and I really didn't understand all those rules until my kids yeah. might had to write or had to sign the letter of intent. And that letter of intent, that's when you waive all your rights. And you get nothing for in now, return. your future, and and it said something like anyone that could claim your inheritance for the future, like your grandkids. So you. No one can claim your rights, which, again, I like to read it. And I, I'm like, well, what if we don't sign that? Can we, can we put a, wipe it off or, or you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, so it, it really kind of made sense to me. The other thing that I didn't understand was that Ed signed that letter of intent when he was 17. And I'm like, how, how is that, how can they do that? How can they enforce something? that you signed as a minor, your parents can sign your rights away. Not, not from what I understand. Right. So again, very complicated in, in terms of understanding the NCAA. And the wording of the rules is, uh, you need to be like a lawyer with 12 years of practice to really understand what some of these rules are. I mean, I'm reading through them like, what, what, what does this even say? It's, it's worded in such a convoluted, uh, inaccessible style that you look at it and say, I don't want to keep looking. You, ever, you know when you have to check when you buy something online? And you have to scroll down and you have to hit I accept and you don't read it, right? You don't read it because it's long and because the transaction, everything's fast until the last second. Then it slows down 
The last thing you want to do at that point is read that language. And even if you wanted to read it, right, it's like, what, what am I reading? And it's similar, I think, when you're, when you're 17 years old, you know, the school recruits you, you're all ready to go. Then they hand you this form and it's single font, single, you know, single space. I mean, you might read it, but you can't get a lawyer to help, right? All you want to do is play. All you want to do is play. That's uh, right. at least for right. me and, and my and my teammates. It was like, for us to play, we have to sign on the dotted line. Show me the paper. Give me my pen. I'll sign it. I, you know, get just let me hurry up and do this and get out of my face. You know, that's. When you got to UCLA, the UNLV part of the story kept going on, right? Because they. NCAA officials wanted to interview. How did, what happened there? Yeah. Uh, How old were you, and t what were the circumstances? I was um, like 17. Yeah, 17, 18 years old. Uh, just I went to, you know, was going to go to UNLV, transferred over to UCLA, uh, and was done. Moved into the uh, into the dorms and, and everything. Thought that I my UNLV experience was was pretty much finished. You know, no looking back. All right, made the de this decision. I'm moving on. Um, and so I, I, I can remember one day being on campus, like always, Tarver, or my, my roommate uh, and best friend now, uh, Tarver, Sean Tarver, he and I both were going to UNLV uh, and then, and didn't really know each other while we were committed to UNLV. But then we transferred to UCLA and became roommates and then became best friends. Uh, so during this time, um, we had went, and this is in the summer going into our freshman year, we had went to the uh, men's gym to work out and play, and, you know, all the NBA guys, Magic Johnson and James Worthy, and everybody's in there hooping. And afterwards, we come out. As we're walking out of the gym one day, uh, one of the UCLA administration had come up and, you know, hey, Ed, you know, Tarver, they're looking for you guys in the in the uh, in the in the Morgan Center, which is the uh, where the offices, all the athletic offices are, and the trophies and everything. Uh, and we had just gotten off. I mean, still got my clothes, my basketball stuff on or whatever. Not even going to the locker room yet. So we go straight over there, um, and we're sitting in the office. And then in come in walks uh, the NC two A. It's like three or four of them. And we're in Coach uh, Coach Herrick's office at the time. Uh, we they walk in and they take us into this other room, uh, into the Morgan Center, and we're just sitting there. And it felt like you know you're sitting at the table and you got the spotlight on you and it's half dim, you know. And there's like three or four dudes in suits sitting at the end of this long table and they're asking you questions. That's what it felt like. I don't know if it, I mean it could have been just like this sitting around, <laughs> but it felt like there was the FBI like this FBI type right. of you know. Right. That's just how it felt. Uh, and they were asking about how I was recruited at UNLV and, you know, were there uh, improper gifts offered and did you witness any in improper gifts given and what was the, what was the, um, what was the, uh, what were the infractions about and, and, and they're asking me these questions. I'm thinking to myself, come on, man, you, got, you guys know this, you guys know the answer. And I, and I, you know, later on I, I said to my, I heard the saying. Uh, I guess any good lawyer would ask you a question that they didn't have the an that they already have yeah. the answers to or whatever you know that sort of thing um and so that's kind of what I thought about I, I I immediately said to myself they knew the answers to these questions uh but they were asking me things like that you know had you seen anything were you offered anything who were you with you know just all kinds of stuff and they never said you can go home and talk to your parents first None of that. Yeah. or you can maybe get a lawyer they just told you you have to start answering questions right now. Right, right away. And, you know, I hadn't even, again, hadn't even changed. Still right. in my basketball gear. We hadn't even, you know. Uh, and I thought that that was really, um, I don't know, uh, unfair, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, again, 17, 18 years old, uh, no representation, like you said. Uh, hell, I thought it, it was we were done with this whole probe, uh, you know, with the UNLV. Uh, and so that was it. And, and that was really my, f like, my first interaction face-to-face -face with uh, the NC2A and, and uh, obviously an unpleasant one, but 
that was my that was my introduction to how this whole um, system works and or and or is run you know and how about the the sort of consequences for taking on that system I mean you talked about becoming a college coach that's something that you've aspired to uh, do you feel as if this case made it harder for you to get a college coaching job because of the because you sort of took on everyone I think so I think so I think um, I think there were I, I think Coaches who could have hired me, administration who could have uh, at least taken a, little, a look at, at me and my, you know, my coaching skills. Uh, I, I think they shied away from me because of this because of this lawsuit. Um, and I, and I, you know, it, to me it was one of those things where you just you don't you don't know if it'll happen. You know, when we first started, I didn't know if it was going to happen, but I was aware that it could happen. I knew that people who have uh, been a part of lawsuits, there were not only negative ramifications or, or, or negative things taught, you know, said about them, but I knew that, uh, you know, you get blackballed. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, and I'm, I'm trying to dance around it a little bit, but I mean, that's just the, that's just what it is, and, um, you know, we knew going in that those, that that might happen. We talked about it. Um, when we were considering it, but um, you know, uh, let me say this real quick. I, I I've had a desire to be a college coach uh, prior to this lawsuit, prior to starting this lawsuit. Going into it, uh, not only did we think about that, but I also, you know, you just uh, you almost expect it, and um, and it, and it wasn't just coaching. Um, there were playing opportunities. There was an all-star game, um, paid appearances that I, you know, um, were, was in line for uh, that uh, they said, nah, thanks but no thanks. Um, color commentating possibility. Didn't have the job, but the, the trial, I, I was going to, I was set to go in for an interview and try out for one, um, for a position. Uh, that they flat out said, you are suing the NC2A. We don't want to. We yeah. don't want to have anything to do with you. So, those kind of things we, you know, we ran into, and that and that was what I was afraid of for my kids, for our kids. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, you know, I knew those were possibilities, but when they were happening to me, I I, I said to myself, I know they're happening to, you know, to my kids in one in one way or another. And my wife as well. So I, I, you know, and I don't know their capacity, and I never, I haven't asked, and I should, but I'm scared to. Um, I know that they were happening to me. I'm, I'm sure it happened to them as well. Rosa, did you have that concern too? That sort of, this is going to be a big case. Lots of, it's going to be on ESPN. That it would affect uh, your three children. I did. Um, one of the things that I used to tell Ed, I said, well, if that is the case. I hope that your lawyers that are supporting this case would be interested in, in really advocating for our kids if, if we felt that they were being treated unfairly. And so um, I, made, I expressed those concerns directly to the lawyers and, you know, and they were aware of, of my expectations in terms of protecting my children. How about protecting the family from the case itself, right? Because this is all in the news and how do you, how do you separate that big lawsuit, you know, PBS does this huge special, ESPN 30 for 30, from you know, just that O'Bannon house. Like, how do you, what are the steps that you take? Um, communication. So, um, you know, in terms of, yes, it was a complicated subject, things that our kids didn't really understand, um, but they knew um, the, throughout the process what was going on. And so that was, that was, um, whether they wanted to learn about it or not, or we would always say, well, if you have any questions, if anybody, we would kind of coach them in terms of what to say if they didn't really understand or know, um, just on, on just generic answers, um, you know, to say, you know, I don't know, it's, it's in the media, it's in the newspaper, I, you know, I know the same things that you know, uh, so not, not, so that they wouldn't be in a, in a position where they would be attacked and, um, 
and they obviously they're in so on, on social media and more than anything um it was the attacks on ed uh once ea sports took the uh the video games off the market and that became a big a big thing and, and by then our kids were a little older they were um in high school and in college so they they understood they they were aware and so but they've always been very supportive of of us they think we're crazy, but they they think <laughs> they they do support us. They don't they don't disagree. There was never like a confrontation. Like, why are you doing this? You're getting in the way. You're ruining my life. We were ru ruining their lives, but not because of the case. Because <laughs> we said no, you can't go out. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the video games, and there's this really untrue narrative that the case led to the end of college basketball, college football, video games. So for years, EA Sports would make games with real players, except they would remove the names of those players right before publication. That's the case, right? That's the. Yeah. Uh, and then Ed's case led to a settlement where EA agreed to pay a one to seven thousand dollars to players who have been in those games. Since the settlement, EA has not published another college sports game, which of course leads people to think it's because of the case. The case isn't stopping video games from being made, right? What's stopping video games from being made are NCAA rules that don't allow players to be in the games and get some compensation for them. Tomorrow, the NCAA could say, we're okay with college athletes appearing in games. And then the games would be made. Electronic Arts doesn't care about amateurism, right? What do they care about? Money. They just want to sell video games. And they're more likely to sell games the more real those games are. So they would love to have Ed O'Bannon and every other player who is currently in college or previously in college in those games. EA, I'm sure, would love to pay for it. So it isn't EA. It isn't the lawsuit which led to a settlement. It's the NCAA has a rule that doesn't allow those games to be made. So whenever you hear it, we, we see it on social media, mm -hmm. right? The... You took away our video games. It's just false. But you know, people, I think, prefer that sort of untrue narrative rather than saying, no, it's actually NCAA rules that disallow them. And you both see these, you, know, you ended the video game thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, I've always felt that uh, if, if that's the way you feel, I, I'm one thing I, you got to understand about me. If that's how you feel, then that's how you feel. I'm not here to change your mind. I, if if you if you want to be mad at me about this, I will take it. I have I have you know that's you know oh well right. I I don't I don't it's it's not it, for me it's always been how how are my kids seeing this you know how is my wife how does she feel about this for me I I, I honestly I I could care I don't it, don't, yeah. it just doesn't matter to me right. you know uh, I don't care but. Uh, I, that's just, that's just how it is, I guess. And you mentioned the coaching pursuit. Uh, there was an announcement today, right? From LeVar Ball. Could you maybe tell the audience <laughs> and your, your role in this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm excited about this one. It, um, so LeVar Ball is, um, starting a league for, uh, incoming would be incoming freshman college, you know, college uh, athletes to play in this league, and it's called the Junior Basketball Association, and it's for uh, 18 and 19 year olds. Um, and these athletes, instead of going to college, they could play in this league uh, and get paid. Um, they would not. Uh, they would not. Uh, now there's going to be educational points mm -hmm. to this, and I, I, I don't know specifically all the details, and I don't want to begin to even try and explain them. But what I will say is this: uh, if you if you are coming out of high school and you want to um, play professional basketball, this league will give you that opportunity. Um, I, some people, some college isn't for everyone. Uh, and if you want to play professional sports without going to college, this this might be yeah. this might be for you. And, and and if you're good enough, there will be there's gonna be there's gonna be tryouts. Okay, 
Uh, and there's going to be a lot of people trying out. Not everyone will be able to make it. I think there's going to be eight spots on each team. Um, so everyone's going not going to be able to make it. Everyone's got a dream. Um, we'll we'll see the ones that uh, that will be able to fulfill that dream. But that's so it's going to be. Uh, I'm on the staff for for uh, consultant. Um, uh, and uh, what's my title? Advisor. Uh, advisor. <laughs> yeah. Committee advisor. Media, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, and there's there's a few of us. There's uh, myself, uh, Earl Watson, uh, who also played basketball at, at UCLA, long NBA career, uh, and uh, the, his oldest one, Lonzo Ball. Uh, he's also going to be uh, an advisor. So the season is like three months all summer, um, and we start out uh, in a couple of weeks for, for tryouts, and there's going to be a team in L.A., Seattle, Houston, San Antonio, New York, D.C., Atlanta, Atlanta and Philly. There's eight teams, eight players a team, probably some, sub, uh, some uh, subs, some reserves, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be a blast. The kids are going to, you know, they're going to travel and play against each other, and hopefully they can... You know, and, and, and what I will say this also, uh, you know, one of the things that we were talking about when we were having meetings on this league, uh, we're not trying to compete with the NC2A. Uh, the NC2A's got their league. They got their stuff. They got their money. They got everything that they that they have. Uh, it's, you know, if, if you want to go to the NC2, you want to go to college, you want to go get your education and, and play basketball for free, more, you know, right. I did it. Had a blast doing it. Started a family while there. Not, you know, love college. But it, you also, if you don't want to go and you want to just jump right into playing professional basketball, you have that option as well. And you both saw that when you were in Europe, right? You, living in Poland and Italy, there were teenage players, very different system from our system, right? Mm -hmm. You're able to, I mean, it's interesting. It's different and it's not different because. If you think about it, if you're what, tennis, golf, baseball, hockey, there's no period of time after high school where you have to wait before you can turn pro. And in some cases, you can turn pro as look a teenager. Look at Bryce Harper. Right, look at he Bryce got Harper, his right? GED at 16 yep. and went on look to at him. his career. Uh, or if you're a musician or an actor, no one said, oh, you're, you have to wait till some period after high school before you can start making money. And no one told uh, John Mayer at the Berkeley School of Music, you can't go sign that recording contract. You have to complete your freshman year. You know, you just you just go and do it. And Ed, in the book, you talk about how in hockey, uh, players go. The Bruins just signed uh, Ryan Donato out of Harvard and while he's in college because he was ready to turn pro and the team wanted him to turn pro. But while you were living in Europe, you had you, some of your teammates were – young players, super Ro young. right? Super young. Rosa, as an educator, did you notice like, how, they, how, how, they, how young they were and how they got schooling? You know, I, I would see these young kids and I thought they were ball boys. I didn't really yeah. think they were um, his teammates. Um, but then he tried to explain that system and that process where uh, there were some in, in high mm -hmm. school and college, they were going to school and they were part of this team and and they were grooming them or they were preparing them to be to play at that at that level um and it was like just this easy transition and there were no rules where you, that you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that so it was just um ed used to give um yeah, they, they weren't even old enough to drive yeah. and so ed would just give uh this one kid he would just take him home to and from practice so picked him up from home right yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we Uber, before Uber. <laughs> yeah. Uber before Uber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was on my way uh, to the gym, so oh, his name just it just I just drew a blank on his name. Skelly, Armand Skelly. Armand Skelly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, but yes, he was like fourteen or something like that, uh, and playing at the highest level at that in that league. And it was uh, fine. Yeah, it was. And cool. He did fine. I mean, that's the yeah. thing is that it wasn't some. No one was saying, oh, how was he able to do it all? Right. Uh, and it, he got some right. playing time. Oh, he was good. He was good. Yeah. He was good. Oh, yeah. No doubt. What do you think, Ed, is going to happen with the NC2A, with basketball in particular? Do you think – you mentioned that the uh, LeVar Ball won't be a competitor of that league, but 
the G League, for instance, is now paying higher salaries. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could get to a stage where alternatives to men's basketball could surface where players can, can they can already go to Europe, right? right. Or, or China or other places. Do you think we'll get to the point where a star recruit, more than just one every few years, but maybe more regularly, will decide, I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to go make some money. Yeah, I think so. I think we'll get there. Um, I, and I don't think it'll be that long, to be honest with you. I, I, I think it'll happen pretty soon. Um, I, I, I always think of myself when I was, um, when I, I, I like to use myself as an example. I don't know a lot of other situations, but I do know my situation. And I know when I was coming out of high school, if this opportunity presented itself, it, if it was there, I would strongly consider it. Uh, if I was uh, a little bit, if I wasn't, if I, if when I came out of when I came out of college, I was my draft in my draft class. There was Kevin Garnett as well. He came out right out of high school uh, and went into the league. He he was drafted number five. I was number nine. So I saw it up close and personal. Similar position too. I mean, in terms yes. of just, you know yeah, skill similar. set, right? Yeah, for sure. He's uh, a whole lot better than me, for sure, no <laughs> doubt. Uh, and taller. He's a little taller. Uh, yeah. A little taller. Yeah. We did he play a different. Yeah. yeah. He was younger. He was younger. Okay. Yeah, okay. Was That's right. Look, KG's going to be a Hall of Fame. Um, <laughs> no, no doubt. Um, but uh, I guess my point in bringing, bringing him up is if, if I was coming out of high school and he was coming out of high school, I think I would have followed that same. I think I would have come out of high school right away and went into the, into the pros, at least would have gave it a shot. It just wasn't popular when I was coming out of high yeah. school. Um, the big thing to do when I was coming out of high school is go to school for two years. Like, you know, Chris Webber did it. Uh, there were a number of guys that went to school for two years. Jason Kidd, I think he did it. You know, go to school for two years and then come out. So that was, that was kind of the thing that we did. Um, so that was my plan. Um, I think if I was coming out, you know, in 95, during that time when it was actually done, or if there was an alternative uh, um, league to play in, I would have considered to do, you know, considered doing that. Um, not necessarily because uh, anything other than I, uh, this is you can play pro ball, you know, if if the if the rules were in place and there and guys weren't going into the NBA, or if there was that one and done rule, yeah. like right now, I would have considered playing in LeVar Ball's league. And you can go back to school. I mean, that's the thing. It's not a one shot. You went back and finished your college degree. Yes. Right? I mean, that's – you can go trouble. back to school. It's not as if it's a one-shot deal. I think often it's sort of linked together that if you leave school early, suddenly college is gone forever. That's just not true. Right. Players go well, um, it used to not be true. Um, in back in the nineties, uh, you were given a four year guaranteed mm. contract. So it was truly a bachelor's education or actually five years. So it was really, you, you were signing yeah. for a bachelor's degree. Now you are just signing a one year deal because that's what our, what our kids, well, Interesting enough, our son signed for baseball, and he did have a four-year guaranteed contract for that set amount. My daughter, she signed a basketball contract, but it was a one-year contract. I'm like, that's not an education. You, can, you cannot get a college degree in one year. What do you right. mean? Um, and she did not get the uh, – she was not contracted to come back. So her, her contract was not um, – renewed the following year but they make it so that it's your choice not to return um again the language was 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 very loose in terms of well if you want to come back there's no guarantee and this and that so i would say now you are only signing a one deal yeah. so there is no you're not you're not trading your your um your skills for a degree ed did and so 15 years later, we were able to have, I'm like, hey, don't you have a four-year, a, a, a bachelor's degree? We looked into it, and they did. UCLA did pay for the tuition, and, and at that time, we were back in, in, um, in Henderson. Um, and so he did a commuter. And so when we 
uh, he had to um, reapply and he had to apply as a non-resident. So we, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I, what does that mean? So again, I negotiated <laughs> and he was going, he went back and we only had to pay for the books. And that was that was a deal, and they paid for for the okay. tuition for him to complete. He still had like twenty three uh, credits to complete, and he was there for about six months. He did like the su two summer sessions in the fall. So, yeah. you know, Rosie, as an educator, what do you think when players go to college for a year, and then go to the NBA, I mean, the, the whole one and done rule, right? Like, why would a school, if a school's focused on education? Is it really a good message if a player goes for, it's really a semester and a half, right? Because right. they play in the, they go to classes in the fall, and then in the spring after the tournament, they drop out and they get ready for the NBA draft. It, I mean, Kevin Garnett, Kevin, Dur, uh, Kevin Durant's jersey was retired by the University of Texas. He was there a year. I mean, what kind of message does that yeah. send about, Really, right? Really yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and he probably made a fortune right. for University of Texas. Right? I'm sure he w generated more revenue for that school than many, almost all four-year people. But what kind of message does that send? That's not that's not a college athlete. What I was going to say in terms of the, the this new right. league, um, I'll say that it's not. I, I don't think the um, colleges will be competing for the same kind of athlete. Oftentimes, in my experience, because I worked at a high school, I would say that a lot of the times the best athletes were not playing basketball for our school because they didn't have the grades. So the I, that's the opportunity that for those for those students. We had uh, amazing uh, basketball players that were just I mean their GPA was under a 1.0. So clearly, you have you know in high school you have to have a 2.0 to play. So for me. I see this opportunity, this uh, this junior basketball association, as an opportunity for those players, for those kids that really had no hope on even graduating high school. I'm just gonna say yeah. it. Um, and so now they have an opportunity for their future to really capitalize on their skill. Yeah. Uh, in the book, Ed, you talk about proposals for making college sports better. We've sort of talked mostly about men's basketball and college football. But one of your central points is that you think all athletes should benefit in college. Mm -hmm. That can you maybe talk that it's not just about male athletes, right? That you, you firmly believe that enough money is being made that everyone should get a fair and an equal share. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, we're all, I think, uh, in college battling the same battle. Um, and that's, you know, I, Get, as, you know, get your schoolwork done, work as hard as you can in your athletic field, uh, uh, with, especially with the time that you're given, um, because it's, it's, it's pretty tough, you know, uh, as far as time uh, is concerned on perfecting either one, if you have both to do, uh, schoolwork and, and classwork. So I always thought that, that athletes, I don't care if you are the starting quarterback on the football team or if you're a reserve on the swim team, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, whatever, uh, or, or soccer team or, or, you know, I don't care what sports you play. Uh, I think everyone should get something, you know, how much that is, I don't know. Um, but I think everyone should get exactly the same um, in men's and women's. Uh, I, I just feel like we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all, battling the same um, college demons, if you will. Uh, so we all deserve, we, you know, if, if, if she played, if she was on whatever sport that she played uh, and it's not men's basketball, I don't care how much time I'm putting in to perfect my craft, I guarantee you she's doing the same amount of time uh, perfecting her craft at whatever sport that she's in. And she deserves to get if I'm the st starting quarterback, um, I think she deserves the same amount as I am, as I'm getting, because she's putting in the same amount of work. And she's – so I, that's, that's just my that – those are – in my perfect world, if, if I was th that dude that making, you know, making those decisions or whatever, that's, that's the route that I would take. I, I strongly believe everyone's uh, equal and, and on the same playing field. 
uh, and and should get exactly the same thing. And you you saw two of your children have been college athletes, right? So you saw how much time and effort they put into it. it Rose, I thought Jasmine made herself into a college basketball player. Took a lot of time. Oh yeah. Right. Yes. Tore both her knees. Yes, yeah, she is. Um, yes. She's. Yeah, she's she's a tough little thing, um, but uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and look, I, I, I'm not uh, my. I guess let me let me just say uh, my biggest thing is I've always thought that everyone, and I don't want to sound like I'm, uh, you know, everyone's equal. Blah blah blah. I I, I, I strongly I strongly feel that way. I think that uh, the amount of time that everyone puts in. Uh, as a college athlete, uh, you should be rewarded. And yes, a, a scholarship is definitely at at one point was reward enough. Um, but the amount of money that is brought in, I think, could be divvied out amongst everyone in in the athletic department, all sports, men and women. That's that's just how I that's just how I feel. And another recommendation you have is that players should be able to sign endorsement deals. That's something the NCAA has communicated that it's now actually considering, is to allow athletes to sign endorsement deals. If that were to move forward, what, what kind of changes do you think that would have? Oh, I think, I, think, uh, I think it would have some positive, extremely positive uh, changes. I think, I think athletes will stay in college a little bit longer. Mm. For one, um, the fact that uh, some of these athletes leave because they have to provide for families, uh, you know, their little brothers or little sisters back at home or parents or whatever their situation is, uh, or you just want some extra money. You know, not everybody is, is broke and, and, and poor, you know, but deserves a sponsorship, you know. Um, it is their... I think it's their God-given right. If you're, if I'm, this is the likeness that I'm born with, and uh, if a company wants to put my face on their billboard to sell a product, damn it, I deserve to be, pro uh, you know, compensated for it, you know. Um, and so that's just kind of how I, that's how I see it. Um, I, I don't understand. I don't get the whole. Uh, um, you're on scholarship, so you you can't you can't make a profit. You know you can't sell your jersey or you can't sell your likeness because you're on scholarship. I don't that that falls short to, for me. I don't get that. So, um, you know, yeah, athletes deserve uh, sponsorships and they deserve to uh, push their brand. You know, a lot of them are coming out of high school with huge social media following. Including, I'm sure, some prominent uh, companies would love to have someone on their cover of their candy bar or something like that or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think it's about that time, you know. There's enough money that's made um, with the use of their likeness, with the use of their faces. Might as well cut, you know, um, put them in. Uh, they should get a check for it. Maybe EA Sports will bring back those video games. Maybe they will, right? <laughs> Rosie, you've talked about insurance issues. You know, you're seeing the insurance forms that you've signed for your children. What do you think yes. about the, the, the athletes that then they graduate and then they're on their own for health care? Learning curve again. Um, as a parent, when we sign the, um, the athletic letters, one of the first things that the coach said to my daughter um, we need your copy of your insurance card even when we went for the, um, the formal visit because she was going to do some drills and they wanted to make sure that she was covered. I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. We'll give you, um, uh, you know, and luckily f there's two types of insurance in our school district. Um, if you are a teacher licensed or in, under a teacher's contract, you only have um, in-network and it's um, only in, this, in the area. So um, anything else is out of network. And so it obviously would cost a lot, a lot more. Um, 
the insurance that I had um, did cover because she went to to Utah. So there were like the neighboring city states. My insurance uh, was still within network. However, when we when she got to to college, they wanted to make sure that she had all additional coverage. So I, and that, I'm like, well, we have insurance, but they're like, oh no, if your insurance, so I had to like give them full disclosure of what my insurance covered and not. And so we had to purchase some partial insurance to cover any kind of additional liabilities because now if they were not accidental, they were injuries caused at the university. And so she needed additional coverage. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, well, they're giving you, a, I'm like, they know it's a risk. They know that you're playing a sport where you're going to likely to get injured. Um, and so, no, we, we had to pay the, not only our, our own premium and insurance, but we had to get some kind of additional coverage for her. Yeah, and that really gets at the idea that there's, if we're going to share the wealth, that seems like something where, reasonable, right, like reasonable that's, that's changes. Reasonable. And, and it's complicated stuff, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're a business owner, UCLA grad, educator. You're in a position where you can read through that stuff. But a lot of people, I'm guessing, that that's inaccessible, right? You get these insurance forms sent to you. and you, How do you break it down? How do you distill it down to it's, something? It's on your award letter. And then yeah. there's like for the insurance, I'm sure as students, you can see that there's that insurance cost. And they'll give you um, whatever it is, whether they're giving you scholarships or grants or whatever it is. And the formula, I mean, if you don't really understand what each line means, which I did, but yes, clearly a lot of, a lot of families, especially if, there's, if it's their first child going to college, it's, it's a very complicated experience. Yeah. And so um, I, just, I just don't think that's fair. So I'm going to turn it over to some questions from the audience now. But before I do so, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Warren Zola, who's here from Boston College, to say a few words about the case and where it fits into sort of college sports, the environment. Warren, why you can take this? Thank you. Good to see you as well. Nice Thanks, job. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Warren Dolan from Boston College. And there's two things that strike me as you hear um, the conversation up here. There's sort of two tracks, right? Number one, coming down to this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Number one is, thanks. Thanks, Asia. The impact that this lawsuit and the courage that Ed and his family has shown is having on college athletics, right? So this is another domino that is falling as reform is coming to college athletics as we know. College athletics has been challenged in the way the NCAA has run it since 1906. There has been issues over decades and decades, and it really came to a head in 1984 in a Supreme Court case called Board of Regents where the NCAA had a restriction on the number of games that each team could appear on television. And they restricted how many games they could appear, and so the schools, primarily in the South, Alabama, Georgia, sued the NCAA, and they said, well, that's an antitrust law violation. You're restraining our trade. We'd like to be on TV more. And the NCAA said, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. We want to control that. We want people to attend games. And they sued. And the case made its way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court agreed with the schools, and the Supreme Court came out and said, the NCAA can't restrict the number of times that their football teams would appear on national TV. Great, but they also carved out this little statement in the case that gave the NCAA the right to continue to protect their concept of amateurism. So what happens when that case gets decided? Mid-80s, cable television's coming around. They're looking for content. A bunch of teams now would like to put their football games on television, and it explodes. ESPN 1, 2, 14, whatever, right? <laughs> it's evolved into what we have today where you can flip on your TV and you'll get a college football game Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? And that case now led towards more revenue, more commercial opportunities. And then you had athletes who said, okay, it's time to stand up and, and figure out how do we get a piece of the pie? 
Jeremy Bloom has a huge case, files against the NCAA. Similar argument is as Ed's, where he's talking about he's an Olympic skier. He'd like to have the opportunity to get endorsements for his name, likeness, image, so he can support his skiing career, even though he's a college football All-American as a wide receiver and kick returner. And the answer is, no, you can't do that. Right. Ed O'Bannon and his family have joined the ranks of these college athletes standing up and saying, enough is enough. It's time for us to get compensated in some way. I'm not talking about open markets and we have a six, eight lefty, three, four man, maybe we'll pay him $200,000 to attend our school. No, no. He's just talking about, let me have the rights to my name, like this as image. And it's not such a foreign concept. Guess, guess who just took advantage of this today? Sister Jean from Loyola, Chicago. Mm -hmm. right. The school has no problem letting her authorize bobbleheads, t-shirts, socks with her name and image on it and capitalize. Now she's giving the money to the school, but God forbid, probably a bad pun, sorry, I'm at BC. <laughs> God forbid one of the students on that team says, well, well, I'd like to make a couple of dollars. No, 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 that's a violation of amateurism. So Ed's case is continuing down that path of greater opportunities for college athletes. Now, just real quick, I'll place this in context and I'll let the audience ask their questions of, of Ed and Rosa and Mike. Right? College athletics is what, one part of the sports world. But you think about what it takes for athletes to take a gamble on their future careers and on their lives and say, I need to stand up for others. Kerr Flood did it, cost him his career. But between him and Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally, they brought free agency to baseball. Spencer Haywood tried to enter the NBA early, according to the, according to the NBA, cost him a couple of years. Right, hero, right? Oscar Robertson fought for the rights for a union, hero. Right? Maurice Claret, which Mike knows all too well and being part of the legal case, finding his way to the Supreme Court, trying to gain access to the NFL to earn a living because of some antiquated rules about age eligibility and entering a draft, hero. Jeremy Bloom, and now you've got Ed O'Bannon. When you look back in 20 years on college athletics, how it's going to be, it's going to be radically different from what you see today. There will be players getting compensated in some way, in ways that today seemed crazy, but we all thought that the Olympics would end when amateurs were no longer required to be the participants. You all tuned in just as much to watch the past Winter Olympics. It didn't matter to you, right? If you know, if the NHL was allowed to play, then you would have watched the ice hockey. You certainly watched basketball in the Olympics, and you're not saying, ah, oh, geez, I'm not enjoying this because LeBron's on the court, <laughs> right? Is it going to affect your watching March Madness if the players are getting, you know, $30,000 or they can sign a deal with Nike if Nike wants to pay for them? Absolutely not. That's what you're going to see. And this man and his efforts and those steps that he and his family have taken are going to be part of that. So just sort of place it in context. Great job. I'll let uh, folks take it over for questions Thank from you. here. Yeah. Well, Thank, you Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. And Warren works with Boston College athletes on the decision to turn pro. So these are issues that he confronts with on a daily basis. So why don't we turn it over to questions from the audience. Any questions for Ed and Rosa, Professor Ann Bartow? Absolutely. I'll bring it over. Direct, director of our IP Center. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Kevin Garnett. I teach copyright law. So he is actually at the center of a really famous copyright case. Uh, um, it's called Mannion versus Coors Brewery. And in that uh, case, Kevin Garnett, it was just a picture. There was an article about him. And it was called Above the Clouds. And there was a picture of him that was used just to, to illustrate the news story about him. And Mannion was the photographer. And then Coors Brewery wanted to use the picture to advertise beer. And then, um, then they decided not to use Manny. They decided to use someone who looked like Garnett in the same pose. Wow. And that was an. Uh, but what's interesting to me about that is, even though he's totally at the center of it, he gets no say in it whatsoever. Yeah. Right. Uh, Manny owns the copyright, and then Manny sues Coors over his creative 
you know, he was a photographer, so it was his creative license, but really Kevin Garnett, it was like his face, his style, his posture that made the whole thing important. So there's just amazing other kind of side issues, I guess, that was what struck me uh, when you yeah. were talking about that, just yeah. to mention them. <laughs> Another well, example of the athlete not having say over how he and, or and she. And copyright law just gave it to the photographer. It's yeah. kind of strange yeah. because then when, you know, the way you're able to get money out of the games, of course, is through copyright, right? The right. Protecting the copyright right. and using the copyright. Right, right. And then the performers get nothing under a work for hire doctrine, even though there's no hiring or paying. It's the same I mean, way that well, the yeah, Professor schools. Bardo brings up no, pay, no hiring our college athletes' employees, right? Because this gets at a key issue where <coughs> many have argued that if you're spending 40 to 50 hours per week on sports, that your relationship with the school is not simply you're a student. It's that you're actually performing labor, mm -hmm. that, you're, that you ought to be considered by state and federal labor law to be an employee. And if you're an employee, in some states, you can unionize, which of course was the purpose of the Northwestern petition to be recognized as employees. It didn't work. But it, it didn't work not for substantive reasons, but rather because essentially the NLRB punted on it. It could come up again. So that, I think, is going to be a big issue. And that would get at issues of copyright, work for hire, who owns what. And Ed, what, what are your thoughts on just the, are they employees? In, did you feel like you were an employee when you played at UCLA? I, you know, without being a lawyer employee, you know, like just, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, look. Looking back, I do. Back then, I didn't. Yeah. You know, um, back then, I just wanted to. I just wanted to play ball, and I often have conversations with myself. The, uh, with your younger. With self. my younger self. <laughs> you know? um, and you know, I I, well, I would off I would often say, you know, to my younger self, "Ma'am, wake up. You know, understand what." what's in front of you and, 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 and that sort of thing. Uh, and I guess, you know, to fast forward to now, I guess I did wake up, but, um, I often, yes, uh, to answer your question, do I see myself as an employee? You know, looking back, I, I do, but back then I didn't. Rosie, while, while Ed was in that position, you, co-owned a business, you were working in it. Did you see in Ed that he was kind of like an employee? You know, because you actually could see employees from your perspective as a, you know, a business owner. Did you, was Ed, did you think of him as an employee of you, you, uh, UCLA? I did not because his passion was plain. Every, he was excited about being on the floor. Like any time that they had like a polished the, you know, that they polished the, the floors or they did. He was just so excited about being there. He stayed um, after practice to shoot free throws. So his passion and commitment, I didn't see it as, as, as an employee. I, it, again, I was new to, to sports, so I'm like, that's just what they do, yeah. you know? Right. So I just, you know, it, there were a lot of times where um, I'd be done with my class and um, go to Poly Pavilion and just read while he was practicing and um it was just you know again just going with his schedule and that's just you know what was expected yeah. and and he was doing more than even what was required of him because he wanted to get better he wanted he had goals and he wanted to fulfill those goals so i i can't say that i did not mm -hmm. then interesting yeah <laughs> we have any other questions yes professor alexander roberts in the back intellectual property expert, entertainment law expert, and, <laughs> yeah, and has written, <laughs> well, you've written on the O'Bannon case, and you've also been on panels on it, so we're happy to. I have, this. but I'm not going to ask the substantive question. I'm going to ask the meta question. Even Will better. you tell us a little bit about what's so exciting about the book, and maybe a little bit about the process of writing the book together? Yes. <laughs> me, me, yes. Uh, what's exciting about the book? Um, wow. Um, I'm not much of a reader, so it's an easy read. Uh, um, unlike my wife, I, I don't. Um, I just I think what's what's exciting about it Sad. is, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's exciting about it. To be honest with you, I just I just uh, I, it's it's. I think it's cool to look. Working with Michael has been. Um, 
uh, a dream come true, a breeze. Uh, he and I talked, for, uh, you know, countless hours. I'd be uh, at work uh, and, you know, uh, knowing, you know, we would set up the day before or two days before. They were going to talk, you know, at, I don't know, 11 o'clock your time, you know. Uh, and then we would talk, you know, at 11 o'clock my time or whatever. And we would talk for hours and hours. Um, and then I'd look up at, you know, because I would sit in my car and, and talk on my Bluetooth. Um, and I'd look up at the clock, and it's like four or five hours later, you know. Um, but we would just constantly just, it was the, for me it was therapeutic, you know. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was one of those things where some things I just needed to get off my chest. We wouldn't even talk about Half the stuff that we talked about is not even, That's most right. of it is not even in that book. <laughs> That's for you know? book two. That's for book two. Yeah. Yeah. That's for the sequel. Um, so you know it was just, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it, was just, it was just fun to do. It was fun to get a lot of the stuff off my chest and, and work with Michael. So that's. And before Mike answers that question, um, I have to say, Ed is, is very soft spoken. He is actually very quiet. That's one of the things that I really liked about him when I met him. I'm like, he's so quiet. I like that. Um, and he's good to look at. <laughs> um, but he, he, um, he, he really doesn't volunteer a lot of information. And Mike did an amazing job at, at getting him to talk and, and share his perspective. And, um, and, Mike, and Mike and I, he would, he would send um, you know, rough drafts, and I would read. I'm like, wow, Mike, you really, you're really doing an, a great job at, at you know, bringing out Ed's voice in, in, in the book. And, and so he was, he was asking all the right questions, and, and he was really um, quoting him in a way that was really articulating um, Ed's message. And I thought Mike did an excellent job, um, and I, I see... I see why um, Ed feels very comfortable. Ed doesn't really have many friends. Like I said, he doesn't talk to too many people. So Mike did an excellent job. <laughs> well, thank you both very much. It was an honor to be part of Thank you. Uh, just to be part of the project. And we have such great rapport. Mm -hmm. I mean, and trust. And, and the conversations that we had were fun. Yeah. I mean, that was the great thing. It was an enjoyable process, yeah. getting back to Professor Roberts' uh, question. I mean, it was... It was fun. Sure. I mean, and writing is not always fun, right? Writing, I mean, I've written law review articles, not fun, okay? <laughs> not fun at all. But this book, you know, for me, was therapeutic, too, because it was just a great, it was, a, it was like going on a journey together, mm. right? And getting to talk through issues that I've studied as an academic, I've litigated as a litigator, but to actually be with the person who, brought this historic case. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And I think we'd all agree, it wasn't that hard, right? I mean, that was no, the, right the no. we, we wrote 80,000 words last summer. I mean, that was the truth. We talked on the phone in yeah. April, uh, May, and June. Mm -hmm. And then in rest of June and July and early August, and Zach Leach is right here. Zach played a crucial role. Zach, put your hand up. Yeah. Uh, doing great, great, great research on the book. To have a team together, my wife Kara is not here. She was also part of the team. Yes, uh, it was a team effort, and it was fun. I mean, it really was great to tell the story. Yeah, Mike would send like twenty pages over the weekend. I'm like, what? What did he do? Twenty pages? Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's Ed, Ed's voice, and it's it's Ed's story. And also, you know, we haven't talked about just growing up. I mean, that part of the story of being, uh, you know, a young basketball phenom, and the pressures that that rings and I mean, may, maybe Eddie could talk which you know the, the fact that gangs were you know recruiting you in a way right and then yeah. somebody said don't do it yeah yeah um yeah it was uh Tommy we were yeah we were we were out shoot man I don't even know it, the story is in the it's book it's in here you gotta buy the book <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's all in there it's all in there that's a sales pitch yeah, right, yeah. Right. the yeah. gang story is in it's here it's in the book right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's fun day though, fun time yeah. for sure. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Oh, can we pass the mic? Thank you, Professor Plunkett. Pass it like just.
carry it or just, basketball? Just throw it, right? <laughs> We're going to throw the mic, but no liability because you're going to sign a form. Right? Hey, thank you, folks, for your time. So uh, I'm Joe. I went to UCLA as well, graduated 2016. Nice. Uh, I was there when Poly Pavilion uh, got reopened. renovated, reopened, and everything like that. Nice. So that's what the question is about. Um, I remember at, um, how celebrated you were as a big guy. Like, the memory is really faint, and you do a better job remembering everything sitting down in front of a crowd, and I'm already like <laughs> blanking out on that experience. But I remember you being a celebrated figure. Your your name is still there with the jersey and everything like that. You were part of the NCAA uh, championship, the last team, and it's been what twenty years now. Like you say, he's got to get its ropes back up. Somewhere. Tell me about uh, it. Yeah. But my my question here, Ed, then is associated with the new Poly Pavilion opening. Did the this whole endeavor that you and anyone can answer this it doesn't have to be uh, only you, Ed. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it's a team effort, as said. Um, whether challenges were associated with the new poly opening, you know, how you were approached, um, whether other lawyers got in the picture somehow in some way, whether UCLA itself um, changed its demeanor towards you or to your, towards your family or even to your, to your counsel, et cetera, et cetera, and whether or not that's in the book. Um, I'm curious to know. Yeah, yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think the, uh, the relationship has changed at all. Um, my UCLA family is still family, and, and they love me, from what I understand, from what I gather, <laughs> okay? Uh, and the feeling is mutual. Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, there aren't uh, Valentine's cards sent, okay? But at the same time, um, I, I have no problem uh, with the, anyone in the athletic department, uh, and, and it just, from what I gather, um, they don't have one with me um, or with us. Well, you recently did the um, Players Tribune, and they yeah. opened the door. I mean, he, he did that that piece there at, at UCLA, and yeah. they um, opened their right. doors they, to, they to opened, you. Right, they opened, absolutely, uh, they did. Um, and so, yeah, you know, uh, and, and, you know. You got tickets to the game just last week, a couple of weeks ago? Okay. The UCLA game, the tournament. Oh yeah, when it came out to Vegas. Yeah, absolutely. No, they read. Look, they read. They reach out. You know, they they. Uh, they still love me. I, I I don't know. You know, I I think it's great, and I I still love them. So, yes, absolutely. Everything is cool. Thank you. Yeah. Glenn Kirkian. A question uh, regarding in, in very interesting your idea of equitable distribution. Of, of profits, but I wonder how much, since all sports are not created equal in terms of the potential risk and injury factor, mm -hmm. and particularly when you're talking about, and, and let's just say for football in this instance, that in fact there is the potential for more injuries, more severe injuries, and more lasting injuries. Um, I wonder about in taking your idea of distribution, uh, shouldn't the compensation then be uh, distributed uh, you know, according to the risk factor? In other words, those sports that are riskier, where there's a higher instance of, of, of injury, that maybe they would get more compensation versus some of the more uh, lower impact uh, sports. And I wonder what, what your thoughts might be there. Sure. Um, if if that's if that's the case, um, if uh, if um, the powers that be, uh, the folks that are actually distributing the money, if they feel that way, uh, then that's then that's fine. Uh, if, if football players uh, deserve more than, than anyone else um, because of the risk factor, factor and, and injury uh, factor uh, of it all, uh, if that is the case, then, that, then that's fine as well. Um, I, I guess uh, for me it's always been you have to start somewhere. And I think – uh, if if starting with everyone being equal as far as uh, compensation is concerned, um, if that's where we have to start, then I think that's a good place to start. And I th I also think that if um, like you said, if 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 findings in, in which they are, I'm not naive to this, um, that the football players their risk, like you just said, if the if the injury risk is is, is so great where they deserve more, should get more and deserve more. Um, hey, by all means. Um, but I, I just I just strongly believe um, at least starting at, you know, everyone equal 
um, is for me a good place to start. Uh, as of now, there isn't anything going out. So, you know, um, but you have to start somewhere. And if if everyone's equal at, at the at the start, you know, uh, it, we can reevaluate later on. It, you know, Rosa talked earlier about insurance. I mean, that's the other way of exactly. creating or, or or addressing that risk mm -hmm. of if you play football or if you play hockey or other other sports where there's a there's a high propensity of neurological injury, the insurance market could be set up that these players have lasting insurance. Mm -hmm recognizing that their healthcare expenses are likely to be greater as time goes on. So that's another vehicle of trying to address that heightened risk. There's a certain, oh, go ahead, uh, real quick. I just want to say certain, here, I'll take it up there. <laughs> <laughs> there's certain, uh, thank you, thank you. I think it's um, right here. No, we're all, oh. Yeah. Yep. We'll get to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just, real quick, before you ask, I was just going to say that there's, uh, Oftentimes, when guys are uh, coming out of you know college and are on their way to professional sports, uh, and they stay back a year, they get you know they get insured, their knees insured, or you know that sort of thing. So that that happens, I guess. Abby. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, do you? We've talked a lot about reforming the NCAA and how the history of the reform has gone, and it seems that most of the reform has started in the court system. So do you think that further reform will happen in the court system, or do you think internally the NCAA will realize that there's something that needs to change? I think, <laughs> I think it's uh, going to be court. Uh, everything is going to happen in the court. I don't think the NCAA is going to wake up and just be like, like you just said, you know what, they deserve <laughs> something. <laughs> you know, enough is enough. How could we? You know, I don't, that ain't happening. You know, and they form committees and they do studies, mm -hmm. but I think you have to just take action. Yeah. Right? I think we've seen that. It, without your case, there isn't the full cost of attendance. Mm -hmm. right? The idea that now colleges are able to offer the full cost of attendance, attendance to student athletes, that didn't occur until you brought the case. And I think the NCAA, look, it, it, it's an institution that has gained tremendously from keeping things the way they are. I mean, no entity that profits so generously wants to see things change. I mean, that's, that, that, they're not unique in that regard. And they're not evil in that regard. I mean, they're just sort of looking at it like they're, they're doing well under this system. They don't voluntarily make changes. And I think it's clear that Ed's case and other cases, there's the Jenkins versus NCAA case that will uh, be litigated over the next year or two, which is about whether or not colleges should be able to compete with other schools for the value of athletic scholarships. Right now there's something called the grant and aid that limits the value of how much a student athlete can get to tuition, room, board, books. Well, what happens if colleges actually had to compete with each other? What would be the value of an athletic scholarship if University of Alabama was competing with Florida for a top football quarterback? Presumably it's more than a full ride. It's something in addition to that. Maybe colleges should compete on that level, but that's not something the NCAA would do voluntarily. I think I think Ed's exactly right that the only way to see change is to is to take action. Look, we've seen that in our country's history, right? We waiting around doesn't seem to always lead to things. You have to you have to fight, and I think that that's really true in sports, but is also true more generally. Uh, Professor Graby has a question. The You're stealing your question, right? <laughs> Good, but I'll ask it in a different way. Do you think, um, I mean, Professor Zolo opined that, um, you know, 10 or 20 years, it's going to be way different. And um, yeah, it seemed like you were all nodding your heads uh, when he said that. Um, obviously, litigation will, would be one way where you could break down the wall. But do you also see promise in things like this league that was announced today, uh, just the free market itself? Or, or is there enough money um, and a will now uh, for people to go in and to start directly competing with the NCAA in a way that, because that too could force change. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. I, I think um, that's the way that uh, we're going now. Um, uh, like Mike just said, uh, for change you have to be proactive. And I think uh, for a person like, in this case, LeVar, LeVar Ball, uh, he pulled, you know, his, his oldest one went to the NBA early. 
the, the second one, you know, was suspended, and the third one, he just pulled out of school and said, to hell with this, I'm just going to do it myself, you know. Um, so um, I think there comes a time when you just say, you know what, the system is absolutely killing me. I'm just going to create my own deal, you know, and that's kind of what he, what he did, you know. Uh, and, and I think more people are going to going to do that. Michael, we were talking about this earlier today uh, at lunch, how there's there are leagues that are going to be popping up where uh, kids are going to have an opportunity to uh, take their – I don't want to say take their talents elsewhere. That's um, – LeBron. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're I going to South I Beach. Didn't wanna, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> but, yes, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think they're going to – I, and and if this league doesn't pan out, um, I think there will be other opportunities, other leagues popping up. You know, the the first time you do something, the first time something's introduced, a lot of times it just doesn't work, and you, it's trial and error and and that sort of thing. Um, so, if again, if this one doesn't work, uh, I, I'm sure something else is going to pop up and and uh, along these lines, and it will give athletes uh, an opportunity to. You know, to to make money while while they play, because that's what they want to do. Thank you, and thanks for being here. It's yes, great. yes, thank you for having us. Hugh McCann. Thank you for being here, and I guess piggybacking off the last two questions with the ongoing FBI investigation, do you think that's something that's also going to push the needle towards the NCAA maybe taking preemptive action rather than waiting for you know? Because I know it's not directly related to the amateurism, but I think it's kind of a byproduct of you know getting these players some sort of. Uh, way to make schooling affordable and yeah yeah, yeah I, know, I, I think it gets at the same set of issues right the idea that um, there are recruits that are forbidden from taking anything because of amateurism rules and yet there are all these schools who want to give them something I mean that's really what it comes down to right that there's a clear market for these recruits God bless you okay. and and yet there are rules that deny them the those benefits or, or, or money, however way you want to put it. And it's interesting if they were actors, if they were tennis players, if they were baseball players, there would be no stigma to taking anything, right? They could just turn pro, but they're in this position where they're, they go to college because that's, in, in the case of football, there's no other choice. And in the case of basketball, that's the conventional choice. And, and, it, and maybe these other leagues will, will start competing, but it's still the most likely outcome. So. I think the NCAA, the FBI investigation will reveal that tons of schools are paying recruits. And some of the biggest name coaches are either directly or indirectly involved. And that, that can either lead you to think, well, this is all so corrupt, right? That's one outcome. Or it can lead you to think the rules are also wrong, right? If they're all doing it, it, it why don't we change the rules so that there isn't this stigma? so that the payments can be made over the table, you know, just under the table. It makes the recruit and his family look like they're doing something immoral, where they may say, you know, it's these set of rules that, that have been imposed on us that prevent us from taking anything, and that if we take it, we're suddenly part of a you know, FBI investigation, and that their name is going to be tarnished because of that. So I, I would hope that, that the FBI investigation leads to serious rethinking about the underlying set of rules that have led to the investigation. And there's a side issue of whether or not these are even crimes, right? The defense attorneys for the coaches that have been indicted have said, this is the federal government trying to criminalize NCAA rules. When has it been a crime to pay a high school student money to go to a college? We do it all the time, right? It, but, but in this prism, it seems like it's somehow immoral or, or the federal government believes criminal. Uh, it, to me, it's going to be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if the defendants plead out. Because if they plead out, we'll never get to see most of the evidence. I mean, I hope selfishly that they don't because uh, I, I want to, I think this should, light should be cast on this. Mm -hmm. right. I agree. Andrew Hansen, attorney Hansen. Great question. We have a number of books to sell, and you can definitely buy them. We'll, we'll do a book signing right after uh, the event. And I'm looking over to my left to see Mary O'Malley, who does all of the work for all of these events. 
and I want to make sure she's recognized for all the time she spent on this. Thank you. Uh, Mary has set up uh, a, a way to, to purchase the book, and, and, and Ed and I will be happy to sign it. Great. And then the second question is, as somebody who represents individuals in lawsuits, Ed, I'm wondering just what the experience was like for you in the legal system. Um, I mean, you talked about having a heart-to-heart -heart with your lawyers and, you know, are we on the same page? But, you know, after going through this for years, did it change what you think about the legal process? Was it frustrating? And, and maybe, you know, Mike, you can talk about one or two of the arguments the that book. I'm sure it's in there, right? Yeah, so just get a sense of, of, of what it was like because from a starting point, I would have had the same reaction you did, I think, which is this is just so unfair. You know, if, if they're using my name, image, and likeness, certainly I should be considered here. So, but what was it like from that starting point to then try and go through this legal process to try and get, you know, the fairness that makes sense to probably everybody in this room? Um, loaded question. Um, I, I, th I think, uh, it, it was, I think it was, it was important, um, to, for us and for me to keep my eye on the prize, um, and not get frustrated with the, with the system. Um, not get frustrated with uh, appeals and, you know, um, oh, we were supposed to reach a certain, you know, benchmark on this date and everything's gotten pushed back. So now we're waiting another six months before we even know if we're going to think about going to court in three years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was so it was just like, uh, you know, it, it was frustrating. But I, I let me. I will. I have to say this. Uh, Michael uh, Hosfeld, the whole time from start to finish, f at the beginning, from our first conversation he and I had, he all he told me, "This is a marathon. This is there. It's gonna be frustrating. There is gonna be months where you and I don't even talk. There's gonna be times where you wish that you this lawsuit was gonna be." the furthest thing away, you you would don't want to have anything to do with this lawsuit. There are going to be times when you're going to be super happy to be a part of this. You know, I mean, there's going to be a, a, a huge spectrum of ups and downs and feelings that you and your family are going to go through. Expect it. It's going to happen, you know. Um, so with that in mind, it was almost kind of expect the unexpected and or, you know, don't we didn't we never let our lives get interrupted she was great in that um when i would come home and in whatever day i was having whether it had anything to do with the lawsuit or just work or because i wrote, woke up on the wrong side of the, whatever uh, i had to leave it where it was when i walked in the house um she was my priority and my kids were my priority and she made sure that I felt that way every time I walked through the, do uh, through the door. So, you know, it's a long answer, but uh, I, I just want to say, um, and I wanted to emphasize, yeah, there were times where it was frustrating and there were times where we thought that, uh, you know, we wanted to be, not deal with it, and, you know, and that sort of thing. But there were also times where we enjoyed it and it was fun and, you know, we got to we got to travel, and I got to sit in court, and you know, and give this to the NC2A. Right? <laughs> right. I'm sorry, but that's just how I felt. You know. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, ladies. Um, but, yeah, First Amendment. Uh, We're a public university. Uh, public university is going to come to benefit us, right? It's uh, free speech. That's that's just you know. It was, look, it was fun. It was hard, but it was fun. It was fun to be a part of. Absolutely. Other questions? Yes. Pass that down. Take a few more and then, then head downstairs. Uh, Thank Abrahamson, you. Thank you for coming. Also an attorney. Uh, I graduated UCLA in 1992. As I mentioned, no thank you for talking. Saw you play a couple yes. times. <laughs> uh, and I, I have a memory. I think it was you, maybe Tyus Edney. You overlapped with him, right? Yeah, we played together. Yeah, I think you guys showed up to a fraternity party. 
Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> you guys, I'm sure. not in the book. Bob not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, and you couldn't wait to get out of there. I was. My my question is, what is it like to be a, a student athlete? Because you were you were a celebrity back then. Uh, yeah, I guess you still are. I'm sorry. There. No, I'm not. I'm not. But I'm not. Um, it, it must have been lonely, I would think. Because you really you couldn't go out without being completely mobbed or. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know about that. I, I it, look, um, you get used to it, but I get, I've got, I guess I've gotten used to certain notorieties, but I'm not comfortable with it. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, I, I, I get it, but I, I've never, I've never felt, I've never liked it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, but it comes with the territory of playing at UCLA on, you know, in LA and winning and and that sort of thing, it kind of kind of came with it. But I mean, you know, Ed, you had the knee injury, and you had people write you letters cheering you up, right? Yeah, and yeah. two of them were Michael Jackson and Paula Abdul. Yeah. Right. So in the book, so in the book, it's you know how many college students with yeah. an injury are getting letters, you know, from from that kind of celebrity. Yeah. That yeah, must have been pretty. pretty and Kareem Abdul Jabbar cool. called your house, right? I mean, is a yeah, uh, yeah. Got a, a, a shoot, man. I, had lunch with George Michael. Um, we hung out with Denzel Washington one That's time. Yeah. There are certain perks, I guess, when you, you know, when you're on a winning team in LA, I guess. But um, yeah, it's. I don't His know. problem is he know. never turns away the mob. So. <laughs> another, another question is back then, tuition for an in state was only $550 a quarter. Yes. Hmm. What else did you get? As a perk, housing, dorm. I mean, yeah, we, what did they what did they give you? We stayed. Yeah, we stayed in um, suites on campus. Uh, oh, sure, apartments. Right. Yeah, well, I forget the name of the suites, but yeah, Hitch there, and the, the special condos for the yeah. 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 yeah, we stayed in. <laughs> I lived. Which I, I stayed in Hitch. I don't know. You stayed in Hitch. Okay, yeah. Hitch got renovated and everything is totally different. Oh, that was is that right? That mm. was a suite. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is sweet. Sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Nice. Nice. There you go. Um, so, yeah, uh, on house on campus housing, um, we got uh, we got a ten dollar gold card, brewing gold card, when I was in school. Well, um, what else? Uh, books. Books, of course. <laughs> Sneakers, <laughs> got some sweats, you know, you know, so, hey, it was, look, it was a blast, it was fun. And they made a lot of money on you. Yes, <laughs> for sure. yeah, for sure. Well, look at the TV ratings, the year, you know, you won the title, they went, they skyrocketed up. I mean, that, that's real value. Yeah. That doesn't go to the athlete. No. That's how they renovated the, yeah, uh, poly right, that's poly right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there any other questions? Okay, great. We're going to now have a reception downstairs. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for yeah, everyone who played a part. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you to much. Keith Testa in the back for doing all the social media and uh, photography, and AJ. I don't know if AJ is still here, but AJ did all the video work. So thank you for, for both of your involvement, and Mary, thanks again. Yes. So we'll see you downstairs. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right.